Well, we are in a worldview study, and really our whole goal is to deconstruct our view of the world that comes from culture. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's not an easy task. Because for most of us, we were born here, we grew up here, we're used to the culture, and we don't see the things that the culture presents often that contradict what Christ is like. We, we often don't see it all that clearly. Now, for some of us who've lived in different places around the world, that is helpful at a certain level to see the different cultures and the good and bad in each. But as Christians, we can take the Word of God and we want to deconstruct the things that we're believing about the world and how we're to live and how we're to see the world that are really formed out of culture, deconstruct those and reconstruct our worldview or how we view our lives in the world based on the Word of God. And as one person said, too often Christians sort of have this, they go to the 97th floor of this uh, really this worldview built by the world, and they rearrange the furniture and they call it Christianity. But in fact, as Christians, we start from the ground up, recognizing God as creator, man is fallen, Jesus as the God-man who came back to this world, who came here, walked among us, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to absorb our sin as our substitute, was buried, rose from the grave, is seated in heaven today, and he is calling out to all men to repent and believe the gospel because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so when we start with that as the foundation, God is the creator and then God is the redeemer, and we start, with a, we start to build a whole different structure. And that's our goal. So we've been going through a survey in the New Testament, which is just really taking it from a wide-angle lens. We're just taking one book a week. We find ourselves this week in the book of 3 third, third John. 3 third John. The shortest book in the Bible. Now, 2 John had more uh, verses, per se, but it was not, uh, in, as far as content-wise, 3 John is the shortest book in the Bible. And we're going to look at this. 3 John is about taking difficulty or making difficulty for the gospel. Taking difficulty or making difficulty for the gospel. You're in one of those two categories. You're either a person who takes difficulty for the gospel or makes difficulty for the gospel. And what this book does is it's written to two men. And one is taking difficulty for the gospel, willing to suffer for the gospel. The other is making difficulty for the gospel. And both are men within the church. And that's what 1 John is going to look at today. But before we jump into this, I want to do a quick review. We look back at Jesus in, in Matthew. Jesus is the authority. Everything he taught and did, he believed was binding on men. And Mark, he's a servant calling us out as a people to serve and to give our life away for others, right? And Luke, he's a savior, not from political uh, oppression or social injustice, but from what? Personal sins. In John, he is the giver of life. Do you know that Jesus believed he could give you as a gift eternal life? So either he was the greatest lunatic or he was God incarnate like he claimed to be. He believed he could give you life. In Acts, the early church went about proclaiming a singular message that Jesus alone was to be worshipped as God. In Romans, you're made right with God. How are you made right with God? Justification by faith. In 1 Corinthians, the priority of the church, that is you can tell a lot about someone's relationship with God by how they relate to others in the body of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, it's the weakness of the church. When we're weak, when we re recognize we've got nothing to offer, then we become strong and we cling to Christ and we cling to the Word and we cling to the Spirit, what the Spirit's doing in our lives. In Galatians, don't be a legalist. We all have a tendency to start in relationship and then end up in rules. Don't be a legalist. Don't end up in rules. It's a relationship with God. In Ephesians, you were chosen to reveal God. He chose you before the Atlantic Ocean was formed or the Rocky Mountains were formed. He chose you in Christ, right, before the foundation of the world, that you would be what? Uh, the per people that reveal the character of God. In Philippians, you're to pursue Christ-likeness through humility. You can't pursue Christ-likeness through pride, can you? Colossians, you're made new. That is, radical change is normal for believers. First Thessalonians, or in Colossians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians excels still more. He says, you're doing great. It was an amazing church, the church in, in Thessalonica. But he says, keep going, do even more. Jesus is coming back. That's still true, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians, a hope that works. He says, go work your job and work for Christ in light of his return. So 1 and 2 Thess Thessalonians both deal with the return of Christ. 
First Timothy, leadership is for what? He says, the goal of our instruction is love. Everything they were doing is working to build love, right? Second Timothy, a successful life. Remember, Paul died cold, broken, alone. No family, friends, or money. And God's testimony, that's a successful life. A lot of times we need to re, uh, regather our minds about what success is. And 2 Timothy does that. Titus is about teaching. In every generation, the church is to teach these truths. In Philemon, it's forgiveness. That is, you can get everything else right about Christianity. You believe in God. You believe in the Bible. But if you don't forgiveness, you don't get, you don't get forgiveness, you don't get God. In fact, you'll never give it either. You find people who are bitter and angry and can't forgive, and yet they claim the Bible, they claim the Word, they claim God. They really don't get it, do they? Because only when you receive the forgiveness of Christ can you extend the forgiveness of Christ to others. And that's Philemon, this tiny book that gets at the crux of what God's about. Hebrews, Jesus is better. He's better than everything you've ever thought of, better than everything you've ever desired, better than anything you'll ever experience in this life. Jesus is better. That's the book of Hebrews. James, get wise. That is, faith applied to life results in wisdom. If you look at the folly in your life, where there's chaos, there's folly, and you track it back, you'll find a lack of faith in some elements of what God is like and what he desires for your life. Wisdom is the outcome of truly believing God and then applying it to life. James is get wise. First Peter, suffer right. That is, we don't suffer for being foolish. We want to, we're called to suffer for doing righteousness. We're living like Christ. That's First Peter. Second Peter is the ministry of reminder. A lot of times what we need to do is just be reminded. A lot of things we struggle with aren't things that we don't know about, but things we've known about for a long time, and we need to be reminded over and over and over. And so that's Second Peter. It's a ministry of reminder. First John, authentic faith has three parts. Remember we said doctrine, obedience, and love. The Apostle John would say if you don't have those three parts, you don't have genuine faith. Doctrine, obedience, and love. If you have two of the three, John would say, that's not real stuff. Hmm. So 1 John is a great book if you're ever wrestling with or trying to help somebody that doesn't seem to get it, but they say they're a Christian, take them back to 1 John and say, hey, have you looked at your life in light of 1 John? 2 John, truth and love. That in real Christianity, these are not opposites that are fighting one another, but truth and love come together. That all of us are going to be battling for a perfect balance of truth and love. Who is the only person who ever balanced truth and love perfectly? Jesus. So we should be looking a lot at the Gospels of the life of Christ as well. Which leads to 3 John. And 3 John is really a book written to Gaius and uh, a faithful brother. And he's being commended because he's willing to take on a great amount of difficulty for the Gospel. He's hospitable. He's loving. He's kind. He's giving. He's generous. He is following in love and in truth. And so he starts with Gaius, and then he says, but Diotrephes, another leader in the church, is causing great difficulty for the gospel. So we're going to look at those two people. And in reality, in every church across the land, across the world, I think you'll find that both of these realities exist. There are people willing to take difficulty for the gospel, and there are people who are making difficulty for the gospel. And if we're honest in our own lives... There's times where we've been on both sides of that fence, right? But what these two men do is exhibit one who's con continually, not perfect, but Gaius is committed to taking all the difficulty for the gospel, and the other, really exhibiting a lack of faith, even though he'd risen to a level of prominence within the church, is constantly making difficulty for the gospel. Since it's a short book, we're just going to read through it together. This is the book of 3 John. It's 15 verses, but they're short verses. Listen to this. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to, you, to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they're strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, 
does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he has done, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this. He himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So that's the entire book of 3 John. So he starts off with the first guy is Gaius. Gaius is a faithful brother. He loves the Lord. He's beloved. He's beloved by John. In fact, he says, the elder, so this is, John is writing this late in his life, late in his ministry, um, to, the, to the beloved Gaius whom I love in truth. That is, oftentimes, John continually uses this idea of love and truth, that they go hand in hand. He says, I love him in truth. In other words, according to the truth. And a lot of times, like we said last week, A lot of times we say, I love them, or I am going to love in this way, and I'll determine truth by how I love. The Bible is the opposite. It leads with truth, and truth determines how we love. In other words, we don't determine truth by love. We determine love by truth. So if the Bible says, this is what true love looks like, then we say, based on that truth, I'm going to love in that way. The world says, I love, and therefore this must be true. Christians say, this is true, and there there are that's what love is. And so we need to constantly go back and reshape our mind because there's going to be times when you're going to be hit with this going, well, I don't think that, or I don't feel that, or I don't understand how that could be love. But the question is, what did God say? Because as creator, as the most loving being in the universe, he knows by his own admission what true love is and how to truly love. And so we're simply trying to figure out what he has said and what it looks like. And so first thing is Gaius, John loves him in truth or in a way consistent with the fundamentals of truth. And so he says this, he says, um, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health. Is that a good thing to, to be looking for, to be desiring for one another, good health? Listen to this. And be in good health just as, you'll, as your soul prospers. So he was spiritually vibrant. John was like, man, I hope your health keeps up with your spiritual vibrancy. It's a legitimate thing to pray for one's health, right? But in a culture that really lives for health, that really consumes many times itself with getting more and more fit, more and more fit, more and more fit, more and more healthy, we've got to remember that first and foremost, it is our soul that should prosper. Have you ever met anyone who was prospering physically and not spiritually? Yeah. Of course, the opposite is true, too. You can find people, and much less, this is much less the case, but they're prospering spiritually and not physically. What are you saying, man? You're just on fire for Christ, right? Spiritually, you're thriving, and I'm praying for God's blessing on your physical well-being that would keep up with your spiritual well-being. That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer. Sometimes we can, if we're not careful, get consumed in the things where we go, man, I'm spending an hour and a half on exercise every day and five minutes with God spiritually. And we get things backwards, don't we? And so the great goal becomes, man, I eat really healthy, I do this. And you say, well, how are you spiritually? Are you that dedicated spiritually? Well, you know, I read a verse a day. Oh, so you're not that dedicated. You see, what we want to do is get it right. We want to thrive spiritually and pray that our physical well-being would keep up with our spiritual well-being. And so, he says, verses 3 and 4, For I was very glad when the brethren came and testified to the truth, that is, how you're walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear my children walking in truth. So what is the great goal? To walk in what? Walk in truth. But wait a minute. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Without love, it's all for naught. So truth has to be combined with love, doesn't it? Actually, when understood appropriately, like Paul 
said, the goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy, is love. Truth should lead us to love. When truth doesn't lead to love, you got something skewed in your truth, don't you? Because Jesus, the summation of the entire Bible was, love God and love your neighbors yourself. So all truth instructs us to that point. Now, his kind of love might not look like our kind of love. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and Paul turns the guy over to Satan, that doesn't look much like love to us. Was it love? It was love. How do we know it was love? Because we believe in the inspired word of God that is without error, that this was actually written, that it was given to them by God, given to us for our instruction. So love might look different or even feel different than what we think it should look or feel like, but it's love when we adhere to the word of God and we say, man, truth should lead to love. Now, when truth doesn't lead there and it leads pharisaically to a self-righteousness, then we miss that all truth was really at its core about Jesus and the gospel. Pharisees missed that. They knew the word back and forth, backwards and forwards. Had huge sections of the Old Testament memorized, but they never understood or connected the dots with how all of that led to Jesus. So it all has to lead back to Jesus. So, um, obviously Gaius is living out these truths, but what kind of difficulty was he taking for the gospel? Verse 5 says, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially when they're strangers. And they testify to your love before the church. You do well to send them on their way in the manner worthy of God. So Gaius is being very hospitable, even to strangers. Now these strangers were people the apostle John had apparently sent out for the purpose of the gospel. So we're talking about missionaries or pastors or itinerant teachers. And in some way they were going out but not receiving their income from a lost world. The lost world is not going to support to spread the gospel, at least not if they understand what they're actually supporting. So it's what God has designed is that the support for missionaries and all of the various ministries comes from God's people, right? He's taking these people in, as we'll see in a minute, in so doing, Diotrephes is turning the whole church against him. Now when you sacrificially, when you take difficulty for the gospel, what we're talking about is it's not easy. He was getting hammered by by others in the church for doing so, for doing what God said he should do. And that makes it all the more difficult when it's Christians who are nailing you for walking for Christ. That makes it very difficult. But what you find is when you try to love other sinners, you realize sinners put off a lot of garbage, right? Do sinners put off a lot of garbage? (laughs) We all do. You know, there's none of us who don't put off a lot of garbage in our life. Now, the more that we become like Christ, the more sacrificial we we become, the more that we learn to be a blessing to others, hopefully the more the garbage is falling away. But we all put off a lot of garbage. So if you're going to love others well, you're going to have to take difficulty for the gospel because the people you're going to love are like you and me. They put off a lot of garbage. So how are you going to love people who put off a lot of garbage? comes back to the gospel, doesn't it? Did God love a people who put off a lot of garbage and a lot of sin? Yeah. So what happens if we don't love sinners, we've lost sight of one key fact, the gospel, the very essence of the Bible. And if you lose fact, track of the Bible, it doesn't matter how much of it you memorized or how much of it you know, you lose track of the gospel, you know nothing of this book or the God of the book. Now, you could be a genuine believer and have wandered in a Second Peter chapter 1 sense so far that you've even forgot about your own sal- salvation. You can't even determine whether you're saved anymore. You can wander that far. But you've truly lost sight of everything he said in here when you lose sight of the gospel. The only way that you can love sinners is when you recognize you're a bigger one. What do I mean by that? You'll never be sinned against by anyone that will even compare with the amount of sin that you're going to sin against God. If you understand that you'll sin against God infinitely more than you'll ever be sinned against, and yet you're dependent upon him to forgive all those myriads and millions of sins, all of a sudden, the garbage that others put off, it's not so bad. You can let love cover a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8 says. Why? Because your dependence on, I'm just glad God's forgiven me. I'm so glad for God's grace. Now, it can go the other way. As you get smarter about the Bible stuff, you can actually think that you are that much better and you can start looking down on other people. 
That isn't how it went for the Apostle Paul, right? The more that he grew in Christ, the greater sinner he saw himself to be. So that at the end of his life, he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. Do you think out of that position, he could love others well? Yeah. You look at the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's written to a church that you wouldn't want to join, I wouldn't want to join, had all kinds of problems. And you know what he starts with? Very encouraging words. I can't wait to see one day God's going to perfect you. One day you're going to be completely like Christ. This is to a bunch of people who were like, there was a guy sleeping with his stepmom in that church. There was drunkenness going on, even in gatherings. This was a pathetic place. And how could he start off with such encouraging words? Because he saw himself as a chief of all sinners. If it goes the other way, you become arrogant and foolish. You look down on everybody and think you've got it all together, and you you've lost track of, lost sight of the gospel. You see, Gaius had, kind of, had a great vision of the gospel. So he could be loving, and he could be caring, and he could be kind, and he could be sacrificial. Mm. And they were t- have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support them. When you hear ought in the scriptures, we don't use that term very often, right? You ought to believe this. You ought to do this. God is saying, see these people who are coming in? You ought to be partners with them. You know, the funny thing is, in 2 John, what was their problem? They were partnering with the wrong people. They were letting false teachers come in, come into their homes, come into their fellowships, and disseminate untruths about God. He says, no, 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 no. you shouldn't let those people into your home. Doesn't sound very loving, does it? And yet he says, this is a very loving thing. This is what you should do. Third John, he comes along, and he says, you should take them in. They're like, no, I don't want them in my house. You should be accepting them. You should be embracing them. You should draw them in. You should support them. Those, no, you, should, you shouldn't. They had a hard time distinguishing that. Do you think people have a hard time distinguishing that today, a false teacher from a true one? Do you think they could easily see the difference between the variety of preachers out there and say, oh, they're prosperity gospel. That is not, that's not the same gospel. Oh, they have the true gospel of repentance and faith towards God, that we are here for God's glory, that God is not here for our glory. Those are two different gospels. We should be clear about that. Prosperity gospel has so made inroads into evangelicalism that many can't distinguish a true from a false. But this isn't new, is it? Second John, they were accepting people they should have rejected. Third John, they were rejecting people they should have accepted. How are you going to be able to distinguish these things? Renee, you're on the front row. Man, I can pick on people on the front row. That's why nobody sits this row. <laughs> well, the Bible says test all things, so you use the Bible as your standard. So the Bible becomes your standard. Romans 12, 2 as well, though, that... Um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing your mind so when you test and approve what the will of God is, you really want to be able to distinguish true from false. Sometimes it's not as clear. Many times it is. But I think Christianity today has often become Christianity astray, right? Where we've lost our moorings. And so what we want to do is keep going back to the Word of God. It's kind of like a broken record, and yet I bet you found it difficult to stay in God's Word last week. It's just a spiritual battle, isn't it? Like, I got a battle to spend time alone with God in prayer and fellowship. There's days where you hunger for that. But what about the days when you don't? You got a battle for that. Because these things are really important that we understand and can see with clarity. So they had a lot of issues as a result of not being able to. And so they had hospitality. They opened their homes for others. Now, in the first century, you didn't have a lot of inns. There weren't a lot of Motel 6s around back then. It's a fairly recent chain as compared to the Bible, right? No Motel 6s, no holiday inns. In fact, travel is fairly dangerous. It's, it's probably still more dangerous over there than over here by far. But back in that day, it was very dangerous. There weren't a lot of places. Christian hospitality was very important. Gaius is commended because he is practicing Christian hospitality. And while we may not have the same context... Being hospitable and loving people and bringing them to our homes and sharing fellowship in communion around the gospel is still important, isn't it? And they've said that the house is the man's castle. And a lot of times what that means is people keep everyone out and they just, this is my little place. And for a Christian, it's a place of, come on in. It's a place of warmth. Let's talk. Let's fellowship. Let's celebrate Christ together. And it still should be that way 
even in a day where there are motels and hotels. And, and of course, back then, you didn't have a GPS to guide you. So often, if you had people come in, not only did you warmly welcome them, when they left, you went out with them. You guided them on the first part of their journey because it wasn't like handing them a Randy McNally map or a GPS and say, you actually walked with them for a while. And so f- this idea of hospitality is really important, isn't it? Just loving one another in practical, practical ways. All of us can answer what the gospel is in a Sunday school way, but really what matters is how do we answer the question of what the gospel is on Monday mornings or on Thursday nights at our home? It's what it looks like in real life. Gaius understood that, but Diotrephes did not. Diotrephes, we're going to see the second person this morning, he said whatever he wanted to say. He did whatever he wanted to do, and as a result, God condemns him. Through the Apostle John, John commends Gaius and condemns Diotrephes. He says this, verse 9, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Did you get that? What did he love? He loved to be first. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not, not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. So you can be sure that Gaius was facing a lot of heat. When you're serving God and you face a lot of heat, instead of going, well, if this is serving God, I thought everything was going to be smooth, I give up. You should say, if this is serving God and I'm facing a lot of hostility, this is just what God said. He who desires to live godly will be persecuted, right? We understand that. So even among other believers, we can face a lot of hostility for going according to God's word. But he says, he, I'll call attention to deeds which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfy this, he does not accept or receive them. Get this, so diatrophies is causing great harm to the gospel. Like I said, in our own day, in churches across this land, there are people who are working to take difficulty for the gospel. They're living sacrificial. Gaius also was supporting them, right? To support those people, did he have to sacrifice of course it takes sacrifice, right? Does it take sacrifice for you to support the Lord's work? Yeah. Yeah. So many years ago it told me, why don't you just go buy a new car? Because I can't have a new car and give to the Lord the first fruits he asked me to give. Well, you need to think of yourself first sometimes. <laughs> wow, this from a Christian? Like I would have expected if they were an unbeliever. But from a Christian? Did you miss that we're going to the kingdom of God? Did you miss that all eternity is ahead of us? Did you miss that God called us to live sacrificially? You can, you can drive a used car. You can do a lot of things. You can have your AC set way higher or eat a lot more rice and beans. You can do a lot of things so you can support the Lord's work. Gaius understood that. Diotrephes did not. It was all about him. His words bore that out, right? He was a gossip. He was a slanderer. How do your words reflect Christ? Most importantly, if you thought in your head right now of the top five people you love in life, who comes to mind? Your kids or your parents, maybe your aunts or your uncles, friends. And we've said this before. Thinking of them and thinking of your love for them does not indicate in any way that you have Christian love. Because we could go down to Harris County Jail and we could ask any of the inmates there who do they love and they could come up with a list of five or ten people. And it would be the same. Their parents, their siblings, their kids, their whatever. It doesn't indicate that you have Christian love. As you track on down that list, think about the people who irritate you, the people who frustrate you, the people you disagree with. And then ask yourself how you love. Do you love them? Now you can decide whether you have Christian love or not. You can't decide Christian love because you've got an aunt that you really love. We've all got an aunt that we really love. You can't decide you have Christian love because you love your kids. Everybody loves their kids. You can't decide that you have Christian love because you love people who like and affirm you. Everybody likes people who like and affirm them. You can decide whether you actually have Christian love by your love for people who irritate you, frustrate you, disagree with you, or cause you great difficulty. 
That's how you know whether you have Christian love. That's what you should ask yourself. Do I have a love for them? Gaius is able to love strangers. He's able to love people who put off a lot of garbage. He's loved to, he loves the brethren. He loves even strangers. He loves those who are carrying out the gospel. Diotrephes is talking in ways and accusing even the apostle John and those who are with him. And you can tell by his words. What do your words say? If your kids listen to your words, do they understand how deeply you love those you disagree with? Or do they see how unlike that you are? You can tell a lot about your words. Not in Sunday school, <laughs> but when you're driving in your car, right? When you just got done talking with somebody who said something that really offended you, and then you hopped in the car with your spouse, <laughs> and then you listen, right? And then you'll know what they really think about others. See, Diotrephes only used slander and gossip and evil words to describe the Apostle John and anybody who listened to the Apostle John and anybody who supported the Apostle John and all these things. And you could, you could assume, well, maybe Diotrephes wasn't as bad as John makes him out to be. Maybe he was just a young guy who was tired of the Apostle John constantly harping on, telling him this or that. The reality is, God's commentary on this is, don't be like that guy. In fact, that's what he says in verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. If you remember back to 1 John, does John take Diotrephes as a believer? He doesn't, right? He says, look, at, look, how, he, look how his life is. He's like, there's no evidence that he's seen God, that he knows God. I mean, that's what really 1 John was all about. If you think back to 1 John chapter 4, he says, We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. The atrophies, there's no way he could be lover of God. Why? Because he hated others. He just listened to his words. So the key would be listening to your words, not about how you talk about your favorite aunt. Listen to your words about the most irritating person in your life right now. Listen to your words or think about what you would like to say about a person that is irritating to you right now. But don't just think about, whoa, I better not say that because now they know Third John. I'll just keep it within. But recognize when your heart throws off those things, it's throwing off the wrong thing, isn't it? Because we're really talking about a heart issue. We want to, from the heart, love Jesus, from the heart, love others. So we, it's really about going back and repenting and saying, man, that person who's so irritating, frustrating to me is beloved of God. Is that right? Actually, the term beloved of God is only used of believers in the, in the New Testament. If you track through every, uh, every evidence, every time the term beloved uh, is, the beloved of God are always God's people, all right? But you look at it and you say, man, do I love like Christ loves? that type of love can only come from the gospel. It can only come from a God who's willing to take me and all my garbage so that I can go out and love other people in the midst of their garbage and not get angry, not get bitter, and not get um, offended. But our words are important. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. And that's Proverbs 18, 21. Or in, Pro in James chapter three, he talks about the tongue and he says, the one who can perfectly can control the tongue, can perfectly control what? Every other element of your body. So look at your words and ask yourself, am I taking difficulty for the gospel or making difficulty for the gospel? The fact is, these words of those who Gaius supported, did they come back around? Did John hear about it? Totally. Did he know of Gaius' love for the brethren because of things that he was not even privy to until his people shared? Man, but Gaius just loves God. He loved us. He supported us. Yes. Did the words of Diotrephes also come back to him? Yes. He's slandering you. He's gossiping. He's doing this. We need to use words that build up and give life. And the unfortunate thing is we've all used words that what? Bring death, haven't we? We're all guilty of that. So, we, so even in that, we can't say, yeah, but they're so irritating because they use words that because that's true of us too, isn't it? And so we're constantly battling to say, let's be like Gaius, let's be loving, let's take difficulty for the gospel, which means not only taking it, but then processing in a way that we don't go out slanderously or gossiping or saying malicious things, but our words reflect a love even for our enemies. Your words reflect the love for your enemies.
And if they don't, <laughs> today's the day to repent and say, I'm glad Jesus isn't sitting on the throne going, you know that stupid Troy? Can you believe that idiot? I'm glad Jesus doesn't sit on the throne talking about me like that. Aren't you? <laughs> so our words should reflect Christ's words, right? Well, he goes on and he... Um, if anyone, uh, actually, he says this, Beloved, don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. And this, that goes along with 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So a good question is, what would people do well to be like you in? And you need to keep excelling in those things. And where would people not do well to be like you and me? And we need to repent in those things and go, okay, I need to be like Christ. Like, today's the day. Like, I want to be more Christ-like. Let me pursue Christ-likeness. Let me deal with the areas that people would not do well to be like me in that. Demetrius, verse 12, has received a good testimony from everyone. And you, you know, the amazing thing is when you live for Christ, your testimony will go far and wide in a positive way, right? Uh, a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write to you, I'm not a, and I'm not willing to write them in paper and ink, but he says, I'll be with you shortly. And so the idea is this. You had two men. One was taking difficulty for the gospel, living sacrificially, willing to say, yep, people put off a lot of garbage and it won't inhibit my love for them in any way. I'm just going to keep loving them because God loved me. And you have another man who constantly caused trouble for the gospel. He constantly is gossiping, constantly nagging and picking apart and speaking maliciously and speaking negatively and doing whatever he could to oppose the actual people who were carrying the gospel. And for that matter, Apostle John was the authority in his life, wasn't he? Apostle John, still as an apostle, held authority over both of these men in that sense. And so one was happy to be a servant and the other was clearly opposed to anything that wasn't what he wanted to say or what he wanted to do. And be careful in our society. You hear people say, well, I just speak the truth. I just tell it like it is. So does the Proverbs fool, right? <laughs> that is what the Proverbs would call a person who says everything that comes to their mind, and they say everything just like it is. The Proverbs say, yeah, that's the fool. Our words are to be seasoned with grace. Our words are to be processed through a filter of the gospel. <laughs> you, you might react in the flesh and go, I want to say... And you go, wait a minute. And I would say, except I just remembered something. I was on my way to hell. And I had justly earned hell. And I would burn alive forever. And then Jesus stepped in and he cleared the slate by sacrificing his own life. And now he is what? Now he loves me. He cherishes me. He cares for me. I'm clean in his sight. I'm redeemed of God. So I would say this about him, but now I'm repenting because that's, my sin, and now I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak about them filtered through the gospel. Our, our words should always be filtered through the gospel. That's how we take difficulty for the gospel instead of make difficulty for the gospel. So third John is what? Taking difficulty for the gospel, not making difficulty for the gospel. Let me pray, and we're going to take communion. Father, I don't begin to understand what you felt on the cross when you took the difficulty for my sin on the cross. I can't imagine how overwhelmingly, um, well, you shed drops of blood. It was so anguishing to think of taking all of our sin on, your, on yourself and to have the Father turn his back on you. We don't even understand how all that plays out. Simply that God of very gods would come and walk among us and would have to suffer the greatest humiliation because our sin had been so grievous against you that it deserved the greatest punishment. We just come and we plead the gospel. We, just, we know our life is for you, Jesus. It's from you, for you, to you. To you be the glory. We want to live the gospel. We want to love you as, as a result of the gospel. I pray that we would just even now, even as we come to celebrate the gospel in, in symbols, that we just be confessing in our hearts. If our hearts have not been loving, even those who irritate or frustrate us, if we've not been willing to take difficulty for the gospel, the garbage that's in other people's lives, and be willing to overlook that and forgive that in order just to love well, that you just convict us right now 
and, and cause us to repent and again return to the gospel. We thank you for the book of 3 John. We pray this week, Lord, as we go out and meditate on this book, that you would change all of us through your Holy Spirit, through this book. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.